In this episode, I'll be talking to Rishabh. Rishabh is founder of Defog.ai. Defog.ai generates SQL and Python codes for your database so you can query and understand your own data effectively. Defog.ai can actually be used in any app, in your Telegram and Discord and Slack bots as well. Even a lot of people are using it in their WhatsApp apps also. So I wanted to understand how LLMs are actually making databases smarter and how can you query your databases without knowing SQL. I also understood and I tried to understand how can you deploy LLMs in production and what are the things you need to keep in mind when you do that. So without any further delay, let's get started. All right. So thanks, Rishabh, for taking out time for me. And uh, it um, I have been following your Twitter timeline and all these things which you have shared over time. I have some questions from that as well. So I hope that you are as excited as I am. Absolutely. Th- thank you for, for having me on Mipple. And like, just really excited to like dive into uh, like just more about Defog and generally how la- like large language models are affecting data analysis in general. Yeah. So before we get started, I want to understand Defog.ai myself. And um, so right now as i have i had worked before as a data engineer so i understand that we have an ecosystem of data analyst uh, business analyst you know various people who who take out insights for us so in this ecosystem uh, what does defog.ai uh, offer and who are the people defog.ai aim to replace yeah uh, no or great question so yeah. So, yeah, so so we're we're not aiming to replace anyone. Like we are all about supplementing humans and just making them a lot more more effective. Uh, so think of Defog as a virtual AI assistant that just lives lives inside your company, uh, and this is an assistant that can one convert your natural language questions into code, uh, either SQL queries or Python code that you can just run um, on databases inside your own company. Uh, create reports, create like what if analysis. So if you just want to ask a question like, what can I do to increase my revenue? It's a really broad question like that. We have agents that then spin up a lot of these these different hypotheses, evaluate all of them, and uh, kind of put them uh, your way and like give you suggestions for uh, how you could uh, in, like just answer any particular question that you have in mind. Um, and finally, do all of this in a really privacy friendly way. So uh, default is this architecture to ensure that your data never leaves your servers. Uh, all we get access to is just the metadata of your, your database. So that's just your table names, column names, column descriptions, and nothing else, really. Uh, so just think of it as this very, very privacy-friendly, conscientious um, AI data assistant that just lives inside your company and helps you answer questions about your company. This is fascinating because uh, if I imagine, so default AI is offering me three things. One, it gives me, let's say, complex SQL queries, which I can fire myself. So especially if I am a startup and I'm generating a lot of data and I want to get insights of it, I have default.ai and I'll, I'll get that. I'll get the complex queries for me. And maybe later on, it can supplement my data team as well. Uh, the second thing you said, uh, it generates Python code. So Python code mm-hmm. for for what exactly? Yeah, so uh, so again, like there are some questions that SQL as great as it is just cannot answer. So if you want to run um, a t-test or if you just want to run statistical models, if you want to create a logistical, uh, a logistical regression, uh, it is a lot easier to do it using Python where uh, mm-hmm. you're still taking in the data from your SQL database, but then putting it into a data frame uh, inside a Python container, uh, running Python code on that data, and then just like outputting the results of um, whatever questions you might want to ask. So as an example, for instance, if you just want to, uh, if you have a data about diabetes, or if you just have a data which has your company's sales over time, and you just want to see what are these things really correlated with, or maybe you just want to ask the question of if you're a restaurant, um, do I get more sales on hotter days compared to less hot days? And so that's a question that you can technically answer in SQL just by like putting in some kind of threshold and just, just doing like an, an if-else analysis over there. But it's a lot easier to answer that question if you just do a t-test uh, on that particular data set. And so um, our Python generation ca- uh, capabilities are much more suitable for answering those more complex kinds of questions. Uh, this is very fascinating. I'll just, I would just like to highlight that because when I was uh, working in, in, in the team of data engineers and data scientists, a lot of people who come from especially computer science background and transitioning into this field, uh, they had challenges of uh, understanding the stats and maths behind it. So if you we have an AI which can actually you know tell me that okay conduct this t-test or this is the code you should execute and then understand 
I think it it adds a lot of value to the whole team and help us generate a lot of data. Yeah, that's that that's the hope. And uh, like so far from what we've been seeing, so Deepwork is live uh, within about twenty three companies at this point in time. And uh, the main benefits we're seeing is one, uh, just letting employees uh, just supercharge their general um, day to day activities because. Otherwise, you just have so much context switching. Like most data analysts, they just want to go in and do interesting, cool projects. But most of their time is just spent answering these quite inane questions by by management. Just things like, "Can you right. just just tell me like how did this this particular metric move over time?" So the very first layer that we're doing is we're just letting like those questions be answered in a much more self survey. The second big thing we're doing is we're also letting companies embed this thing inside their product. So if you're uh, an e-commerce store and you want your merchants to be able to just ask questions about how they can improve their performance, et cetera, uh, you can just do that like via defog instead of increasing your support costs very, very significantly. Um, and, and the third big thing for us has just been in ensuring that all of those data access issues are, are well taken care of. And um, uh, so we have a bunch of med tech companies in the US using us right now who for obvious reasons can't really share their data mm-hmm. with us. Um, but there, that the privacy friendly nature of it just really, really helps um, in uh, in ensuring that they can answer their questions without their data ever leaving their servers. Hmm. So, b- before we move forward, I want to understand where is the LNM component here. So, I understand that LNM component generates SQL queries and uh, Python code. So, do I get a prompt uh, bar like Chat GPT's sir interface where I can type in the questions and I can get the answer from there? Yeah, yeah. So so we essentially have these React components that you can embed inside your, your application where often what we see is people love embedding this thing inside their dashboards because uh, when someone is looking at a dashboard, like that's when they, they kind of think of, oh, like that's an interesting, like that data has moved in, in a pretty interesting way. Let us figure out that like level two or level three question about why that trend might have, uh, have, have happened. And so... Um, that's where we're seeing like the best use of defog so far, like just as this assistant that sits within your dashboard somewhere to augment your, your product in general. Um, the other big thing that we're seeing is increasingly people want to, to do this thing from within their Slack channels, uh, from within mm-hmm. their Telegram bots, um, particularly for, for our Asian users, like they've been asking this as a part of WhatsApp bots as well. And so um, that uh, is, is, again, a quite interesting thing for us because often what happens is someone is just asking within a Slack channel, hey, like, what happened to this particular trend last week? And so we've seen a lot of our customers just like tag the default bot and uh, ask questions so they can just get that particular answer within their Slack bot. To your earlier question about um, where exactly is an, an LLM coming in? So... What we do is we just, uh, at the time the customer is setting us up, we just look at their database schemas metadata. Um, mm-hmm. So whether like people are just using a Postgres or Snowflake, Redshift, whatever, uh, we connect with all major databases and um, we just look at your information schema table. And from there, we're able to just extract your table names, column names, column descriptions, if any. Um, we just send those to the Defox server. Um, and then in the future, anytime you ask a question, um, we just look at that particular uh, database schema that we have stored. Uh, we also have options for people to just like set up uh, what we call a glossary. So like if they just have special instructions or they just want to want to teach the model that certain acronyms mean certain things, um, and so on uh, and so forth, they can use uh, they can just use the glossary function to do that. And uh, as soon as that is done, uh, we're then able to just both come up with a reason for why. Um, a particular question is being answered by a particular SQL query or a particular piece of Python code and return the actual code itself. And then we have these, these libraries in Python or Node where if you just want to execute um, this return SQL query on your own um, server, then uh, those those libraries just make it super, super easy to do that. Uh, so a lot of questions <laughs> based on uh, the things you spoke. So one thing is that uh, this is very fascinating because I was I thought that it is a SaaS default.ai, but now I understand that it's more like a pluggable tool. So if mm-hmm. I am building my own thing, I can use default.ai there mm-hmm. instead of having it separate. All mm-hmm. right. So um, one thing, let's say I I have an app. So you uh, one thing is query generation, and another thing is query execution. So mm-hmm. if I have a WhatsApp group or a Discord bot or a Slack bot, whatever I want to make, where will the queries be executed? 
So the queries are all being executed on your own like uh, data Thank server. You. Uh, and okay. so uh, that can either be a Lambda function, it could be a Google Cloud function, it could just be uh, something that you're running inside a web app. Uh, it could mm -hmm. just be something that's inside like a cron job uh, of yours. But all of these, these queries are just executed always on your own servers uh, using the default Python or Node libraries. Okay. So uh, does it mean that while setting up default, I'll also have to give access to my own cloud or the compute level of uh, thing, or do, do you just fire the query to the data warehouse and it figures it out how to execute it? Yeah, so so the way it works is uh, we require all of our customers to just have some kind of backend or a microservice. Uh, and so there's a microservice that they can just deploy in one click if they want. So like using our CLI, for example, if you just like after setting up, if you just like type in default deploy GCP, uh, it will um, just automatically deploy a Google Cloud function for you. Uh, mm -hmm. And that Google Cloud function is, is doing both the thing of taking in an in input data that like a user might uh, ask, um, mm -hmm. then sending that particular question to the default servers, uh, getting the SQL query or the Python query it's supposed to generate back, um, and then just executing that particular query against your own database. And so mm -hmm. all of this execution happens uh, in this, this Lambda function or, or Google Cloud function, uh, which is just like, again, in our customer's own cloud. Um, and so we never really get access to our customers' databases. So like our servers do not know what your database host is. Uh, all they know is just what database type you're using, what's the database metadata. Um, and once we have that, it just like returns the data back um, to uh, this particular microservice. And the microservice then like executes the data, sends the data back to the front end, uh, which again is either a React component, um, your, your Slack bot, Telegram bot, or something else altogether. Hmm. Um... So while generating the uh, SQL code, not all the databases are same uh, SQL compliant or they not everybody uses same SQL. Yeah. Uh, so how do you handle that? Let's say I have got Cassandra and I have got maybe Redshift. So it's a different SQL syntax for both both of them. So how does yeah. that work solves that? Yeah, no, so so we, that, that was honestly a huge, huge challenge for us. And so we had to fine tune uh, different models for each um, like each database. database really. So, mm. uh, so like starting off from just like, like Postgres and MySQL is just like very, very different. Uh, Postgress, for example, has an I like operator and MySQL does not. Mm. Um, and then again, uh, Postgres and Redshift uh, or Snowflake, while very similar, um, there are certain things that are there in, in Postgres, like say the filter statement that is just not there in Redshift. Um, mm. And so we just had to fine tune the model for each different database separately um, in order for it to work reliably. Uh, and so all SQL or SQL-like databases are still like generally okay. And so how mm -hmm. like we kind of fine tune that was, uh, we fine tune what we call like the default foundation model uh, for SQL. And so this, this foundation model just kind of looked at your general, like generally accepted SQL practices. And then from that, that foundation model, we had to fine tune it further uh, to mm -hmm. create a variant for each particular database. Hmm. So uh, talking about this foundational model, which you just mentioned, so, did you write this model or can you tell me a little bit more about the foundational model? Like, is it your IP or, or what? Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. So when we first started out and this was, I think almost six months ago now, like we we're just using an open AI thing, uh, like as the backend and then like, we just fine tuned these text of G003 models. Um, but I think over the last couple of months, we're starting to move, move away from that. And so at this point we serve most of our traffic through, uh, our own models. And so, mm. uh, these have been generally just been fine tuned on like different open source models. Uh, and, but like those open source models are just like changing every week at this point in time. So um, at this point, like, so initially we just like done this um, experiment uh, with fine tuning Llama, like obviously because of their um, license, we couldn't deploy that in, in production, but that was a great experiment where we just fine tuned this um, Llama 13 billion parameter model. And that yielded pretty like solid results. Um, and at this point in time, like Wizard LM and Wizard Coder are two models that are just performing absurdly well. Uh, I think mm -hmm. on uh, on human eval benchmarks, uh, Wizard Coder is now outperforming Cloud's model, um, and it's nearly competitive with GPT 3.5, uh, which is like the main mm -hmm. chat GPT model. Um, and that's just for, with a 15 billion parameter model. Um, mm -hmm. I think. As like given how things are moving right now, uh, I expect open source models to be competitive uh, with mm -hmm. GPT-4 in another three to six months or so. And the main reason for that is because if you kind of think of 
all these parameters in these large language models, so like GPT 3.5 or 4, they know everything from how to run Python to who the president of Liberia was in 1965. Um, mm. And there's, there's a very small subset of that that you actually need for uh, just generating like normal um, SQL code or Python code. And so the number mm. of tokens you need, the number of parameters you need is just like a significantly constrained set. Uh, mm. And uh, already, like we're just seeing that wizard um, quarter just with 15 billion parameters, uh, it's, it's already like really, really good. And uh, assuming things just like continue going the way they're going, assuming like we continue to fine tune a lot more uh, of these models, I expect it to just like improve by two or three orders of magnitude in the next year or so. Mm -hmm. in pretty interesting. So basically, uh... You're saying is that there will be niche LLMs or, uh, you know, maybe domain specific LLMs available soon or they are available already. Yeah. And uh, I think already what we have, I wouldn't even call it domain specific or niche. I would just say that like for code generation, which itself is like mm -hmm. a very, very broad domain, uh, right. you, you have these, these LLMs available. And uh, already what you can do is you can just take one of these, these LLMs and just fine tune it to your particular domain. Um, mm -hmm. And so as an example, if you want to fine tune a wizard LM model uh, or, or, or a wizard coder model um, to uh, something that, that is uh, a medical SQL or like Python generation uh, model uh, given like a database team and like particular questions, uh, that is something that you can already do ridiculously cheaply. Uh, so mm -hmm. we've been doing these experiments, which cost us about $1,000 or so. Uh, and like just with the thousand dollars of compute, you can just like fine tune one of these models into something that works really, really well uh, on uh, very, very niche domains. So can you tell me a little more on how you are doing that? Because I have not read or, you know, I don't think a lot of people know how do you efficiently deploy these models, production scale, large, um, you know, large loads. How do you handle that? What's the strategy yeah. at default.ai? Yeah, no, great, great question. So, so let's like divide that into three things. So the first is how do you how do you kind of like train and fine tune the models? Uh, the second is once you fine tune the model, how do you deploy that into production? Uh, mm -hmm. And the third is once it's, it's in production, how do you kind of serve a lot of data at scale um, mm -hmm. with these models without bankrupting yourself? Uh, yeah. Right. And so, uh, so the very first thing is uh, in general, if you look at the cost of kind of creating a new foundation model from scratch, uh, that's still like in the six uh, figure, like mid six figure or low seven figure dollar amounts. Um, but uh, the good thing is that you don't have to do that anymore because you just have so many open source models that, that have already come out. Uh, there's a Falcon uh, 40, like 40 uh, model, which was released by um, uh, the UAE uh, very, very recently. You also have um, these wizard LM models, you just have a, a bunch of like open source models that, that are coming out recently. All of these had uh, Meta releasing Llama as almost a precursor uh, because mm -hmm. once Meta released Llama, um, and even though like they did not uh, open source it in the, the true sense, it was just like the release of weights um, for research use only. And then some researcher just put it on 4chan as a torrent mm -hmm. for other people uh, to download. And then the open source community kind of like just, just, just took over it started like hacking things uh, around with it and um, uh, realized that even though these were like tiny models, like the, the, the smallest Llama model was just 7 billion parameters. And that's something that if you just quantize it, you can run it on like a single MacBook machine. Um, so, uh, so even small models like these, they realize that once fine-tuned well on particular data sets, um, they can just start generating ridiculously good results. Uh, and so what we saw was uh, this approach where uh, a bunch of researchers, I believe this was from Stanford, I may be wrong there, but um, they essentially took this, this, this Lama model. Um, they also looked at some uh, questions and asked GPT 3.5 to answer those particular questions. And so uh, they had a data set of, uh, I believe about 70,000 question answer pairs uh, that they just like generated via um, OpenAI's GPT 3.5. Uh, and then they kind of fine tuned these Llama models based on that data set. Um, and they called this model Alpaca. Um, and mm -hmm. Alpaca had ridiculously good results. Uh, it was able to imitate a lot of these, these capabilities um, from some of these, these larger models uh, as long as it was fine-tuned well. And so uh, I believe all of this happened uh, maybe February or March. 
Uh, and since then, uh, it's just been this process where people are just making this fine tuning process a lot more efficient. A lot of, of other um, organizations have now uh, kind of released their own open source models, uh, which don't have um, the kind of commercial um, issue, like, 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 like licensing issues that Meta's Llama has. Meta itself uh, has recently said that um, they might consider releasing open source models with like much more permissive licensing as well. Um, so there's just so much going on in this open source LLM space. And so, um, so even though it is quite expensive to, to kind of train a foundational model from scratch, if you just want to fine tune, uh, so like that alpaca thing I was talking about earlier, I believe that was about $300 worth of compute. Uh, and so that is just much, much cheaper. And so you can start fine tuning a lot of these, these pre-existing models um, into much smaller uh, uh, and like far more, 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 well uh, more well-defined models. And so that's kind of like just that, 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 that training bit, right? Um, now, as to how you end up deploying these, uh, these models for inference introduction, um, one of the really interesting th things that you can now do is you, you can quantize these models. And so what that means is um, most of the model weights of these, these large neural networks, they're sort of like float 32 values. And so each value is basically worth a particular amount of space in memory and right. on disk. Um, and so initially, uh, and like many, many years ago, a lot of people had like started just like going from float 32 to float 16. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of it is, uh, is because uh, once NVIDIA had the RTX series, they could actually start to, um, to take in like float 16 values and run those on the GPU as well, instead of requiring it to be float 32 values. And so like that kind of made the models a bit more efficient. And so now uh, a lot of this thing has just gone into so much um, like uh, optimization. So there's this guy called, uh, I believe, Greg uh, George yeah. Golanov. Uh, and so he's been like, he's released like llama.cpp and right. there you're using integers to represent these like model weights. Uh, mm -hmm. And that just like makes everything so much more, more efficient as well. And so now they're like, they're even doing experiments where they're trying this with like four, uh, like four byte in quantizations instead of like the wow. typical size. And so things are just like getting much more efficient, much more quickly. Uh, so, uh, so, so we're basically using a quantized model for, for deployment right now, uh, just so that, uh, we can like serve these things at scale, uh, without it causing a lot of, um, uh, of GPU costs. So, uh, I've been rambling for a while, so like, I'll just stop there and like, see if you have any, any follow-up questions there. No, no. I mean, this was very fascinating and, um, interesting to know this. So, uh, during deployment, do you have got, uh, one model per customer or per, um, database? How, how, how does so, that happen? Yeah, so, so for us, it really depends on, on what kinds of customer these are. So uh, mm -hmm. for, for enterprise customers, like we have a fine-tuned model that is completely fine-tuned just on their domain. Um, mm -hmm. And for other customers, we kind of have models that where the model's weights itself uh, might, may not be fine-tuned on like a given customer's domain, but we almost cluster customers into similar um, industries and like similar database types. And so uh, they kind of get this model that is fine-tuned for their general use case. Hmm. So there's, um, you said that, you know, you will uh, fine-tune the model for this use case. And I had a question written down that usually data scientists and data analysts are domain-specific people, right? So even in computer vision, when I was working, so there are people who work with um, cameras which are not moving and some cameras which have or visual audiometry and stuff. So uh, if I want to use defog.ai uh, LLM for that, so if I simply, um, let's say if I simply start using defog.ai, defog it will work on the clustered thing which you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is an option for me to ask that, hey, please fine tune the model for me so that yeah. you know I can get more optimal results. Yeah. Yeah, a hundred percent. And in fact, for for a lot of our, our enterprise customers, like for example, we're working with these this very large uh, publicly listed company in the in the US right now, which deals with a lot of this US billing data. And so, um, in like, so there are a lot of these these health codes. Like, there's something called CPT codes. There's something called ICD-10 CM codes. Um, and so, if say you just want to look at like look for how many people had cholera, uh, you kind of have to like uh, convert that question. Uh, like like 
of, of cholera into like the right ICD-10 CM code um, in order for it to like be able to, to even query that particular uh, data set. And so for that, we just had to, uh, so we have something like we have a model called MetSQL model um, mm. just for that particular use case. Another big use case for us is just fintech. And so uh, a lot of the times let's say people just want to like talk about their accounts, uh, accounts receivables or certain financial ratios where they just want to talk to the machine. Like they don't want to say that this particular ratio is this number divided by this other number. And so for those things as well, we've had to fine tune the models uh, a fair bit. And um, the more customers we're getting, the more we're kind of like fine tuning these models for these, these particular clusters. Hmm. I also saw... Um that you were using um, defog.ai for uh, building a Google search for your Notion. Uh, mm -hmm. I saw a tweet a few, few, time, uh, few days or few months ago, I guess. So what is that about? Can we do it? <laughs> or uh, is it open for B2C use cases as well? Yeah, no, uh, great question. So so that's an experiment that, that we have been running. And um, the, the reason for that is because once we showed what we had to our customers, um, they looked at it and they they thought, hey, like this thing is really useful. Um, and the question they they've had once they start using it for general structured data analysis is cool. Like it works really well for this. Uh, and that interface where you just have like a, a single like question bar where you can ask, like just give it any question and it'll answer the question for you. Um, so their main thing was that, what if I just want to have one question, but like one bar where I can just ask mm -hmm. any kind of question. Uh, be it for, for structured data or for unstructured data. And so that's an experiment that we're running where uh, if our customers just want information about this um, unstructured data as well, uh, that is an experimental uh, thing that we are, are, are offering to customers. Uh, and the way that works is, is actually like very simpler than, uh, than this, this like, like structured data query thing because uh, essentially what you want to do there is once you've, you've connected to a bunch of data sources, you want to convert that into an, an embedding space. Um, and uh, then, then anytime you have a query, you just convert the query into that, the same embedding space. And then you can just compare the embedding, like where this query is in an embedding space versus where all of these other documents are. Uh, that can just be a simple like cosine similarity kind of search. Um, you get your top end results. Like these could just be like your top 10 or top 15 results. Um, and then you can just take those text snippets, put them inside a prompt and uh, then kind of do some kind of prompt engineering to like answer that particular question that the user ha uh, has asked. Um, so that is in fact something that we plan to open source very, very soon. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's just a ridiculously straightforward way of, uh, of, of answering questions with unstructured data. And mm -hmm. uh, for us, while it's, it's never gonna be the main thing that we do, uh, but it is a really good complement uh, mm -hmm. to some of the, like, these things that we're doing with structured data anyway. I have one question which is not technical, but uh, I just want to understand your take on this. I usually see a lot of people building in stealth, mm -hmm. while defog is actually completely opposite of that. I have see even seen a calendar where you were shipping every day for th yeah. for thirty days. Yeah. So, <laughs> what is that uh, thought process like? So, why are you building in public? What what uh, what good it has brought you? I think building in public one just lets you get feedback so much more quickly because if, if, if we are just building in stealth, we don't know what's resonating with people, what's not resonating with people. Um, there's also just this pressure of if you're like building in public, um, you're, you're almost as a, as a founder creating this, this pressure on yourself to be accountable to all these people who have been like following along uh, your, mm -hmm. your progress. And so we've done these two daily shipping things where uh, like once in January and once in May, uh, we're just shipping uh, a feature every single day. And uh, there's no way we, we, we could have done that uh, if we weren't building in public because every like both the times I did this thing after the first eight or nine days, I was, I was just like, why did I commit to, to doing this feature a day thing? Um, but there's just something about getting yourself in that cadence where you're just like pushing yourselves, pushing uh, your team to uh, be creating features that people actually want. Um, the other huge thing it has done for us is like, we just get so much more inbound um, from people mm. we just like could never have met otherwise. Um, and a lot of it is just because they see that we're doing something on social media. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of the time there's something on Twitter or there's something on LinkedIn. 
Um, and uh, they think, hey, like this is this is interesting. Like this, this, might, this might actually be useful for my company. And so um, all three of like the large enterprise customers that we're working with so far, uh, we've gotten them through inbounds generally um, via wow. our like so, so, social media posts. So mm -hmm. that has been an incredibly useful way for us to just get a lot more inbound, iterate really quickly, figure out what's working, what's not working. And then really double down on the things that, that are working and ignore the things that aren't working as well. Hmm. So, I mean, I was uh, watching a podcast and there, uh, there were two entrepreneurs who were discussing that in today's era, especially in US and in India, there is a strong, uh, uh, so there is a strong curiosity in, in the masses where people want to know who the person is be behind the brand. For example, people are buying Tesla because they want to be in Elon's clan. Just giving an example out there. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about this? Let's say if somebody wants to start up today and uh, let's say that person has got a strong social media presence and talking about the same thing in which he wants to start. Do you think it adds benefit in building a, into your own brand or your own personality, what people often say? I think it, it depends. Uh, if you're doing a B2B startup, I, I think it has limited value uh, because mm. then uh, kind of, Ensuring that your company has a really strong brand uh, is just far more more useful, and also because a lot of your 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 buyers, like if, if they're say uh, developers in 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 other startups or larger companies, like they, they just care about can I integrate with this thing easily and like does does it work well? Like okay. they they don't really care about your your life story at all. I think it's very different for B two C brands, where mm -hmm. uh, if you are uh, almost like uh, a motion like company or or even like a company where you want to start selling to prosumers almost and, and then kind of like go up uh, with these like 20, 30, $50 a month subscriptions uh, and mm -hmm. like then go, 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 go up market from there. Uh, I think it makes a lot more sense for founders to put themselves out there a lot more um, with that. But uh, at mm -hmm. least from, from, from what we have seen, um, the B2C uh, or rather like in, in, in a B2B context, a personal brand doesn't really help all that much. Mm. Cool. Thank you for answering that. So coming back, uh, I have one question. So uh, while I, when I was working as a data scientist, there uh, the uh, the person who had hired us, um, those people were really interested in understanding that why AI is giving us this result. Uh, in LLMs, I have not followed it, so I don't know, and I am relying on you for the answer. What is the uh, state of explainability in LLM? So how do you ensure that what your results, your queries are actually right and will give the results what user wants? Yeah, uh, so this this uh, approach called chain of thought reasoning. And so there, uh, what, you, what you always want to do is instead of just asking the LLM to give you the answer, uh, you want the LLM to come up with an approach for like coming up with an answer uh, and only then come up with an, an answer. And so because LLMs are just like machines where they're looking at what is the text that has come before this particular text and then like predicting what text should come right after this. Uh, so, so because that is all that LLMs are doing, if you ask them to come up with an approach first, uh, mm. then they'll kind of like come up with that approach and like that, that, that approach is typically very, very human explainable. Um, mm. and, uh, uh, and then, uh, so if say you just wanted to like create a SQL query to answer a particular question, if you ask your, your LLM to come up with a reason for, for this particular query before it spits out the full query, um, mm -hmm. then one, that's just far more explainable to the end user because like they can see what the reason for this query was. And two, mm -hmm. um, your actual probability of getting the SQL to be correct goes up significantly because of this, this like whole chain of thought uh, mechanism. Hmm. And um, regarding this, uh, while talking about having more explainability and stuff. So user may also want to understand that model is not uh, getting biased uh, because I have seen that in LLMs, usually it is getting biased in some results. So in your domain, when I'm playing with customer data and um, you know I'm trying to give it some answers, what type of biases often come uh, and how do you deal with them and ensure yeah. that model gives the right results? Yeah, no, that is an excellent question. So in fact, uh, uh, one of uh, the, like one of the, uh, the people who's working with us, Samarit Pansal, um, he did this really interesting project where he looked at this very controversial data set, which was just um, IQ and gender uh, mm -hmm. and, and age and like a bunch of, of, of other metrics. And um, 
he basically used LLMs to just uh, ask questions like, based on this data, should I hire a male or a female for uh, the role of, of mm. a scientist or, mm. uh, or things like that? And so what we realized was if you don't give the LLMs any kind of like prompt, if you don't fine tune it at all, um, often it'll just take the simplest approach, it'll just like take the average. Um, mm. And so it'll just like take the average, uh, it'll just like a simple group by, by, by gender and add IQ and like just give you an answer, which is obviously not the right way to go about it. Um, but if you prime the LLM a lot more, uh, if, if, for example, you just ask it to always run statistical tests um, with a particular uh, confidence level uh, before uh, spitting out any answer, uh, then it'll kind of always uh, run those, those statistical tests, uh, check for students, courses, et cetera, et cetera, uh, all, all of the things that like as good data scientists we're supposed to do. Uh, before mm -hmm. giving you like the final answer there. So we've realized that a lot of it is just about how you fine tune the model and mm -hmm. uh, what kinds of instructions are you giving it. Um, the other big thing for us uh, has also been to, uh, to make sure that any recommendations that the model is giving, which aren't just descriptive stats, right? So if all you're asking it for is, uh, is just like, what were the like, what are the top 10 users by, by revenue? That's a very like straightforward answer. But if you're, mm. if you're asking something like, who are our best 10 users? That's a very vague mm. question. And so there the LLM can, uh, it, it generally like just comes up with a metric completely by itself. Sometimes it'll think of revenue, sometimes it'll think of like profitability. Um, other times it, it will come up with something that's around say frequency of visits, et cetera, or like users that just haven't shown for a long time. So, so, so that is when uh, we always ask for our, our customers uh, to just give us a lot more context for answering those kinds of questions. Um, mm -hmm. The other really useful thing you can do in, in LLMs is this, this, this whole notion of log props. And so for each uh, word that the LLM outputs, you can see the probability distribution of what are all the other words that the LLM was considering outputting instead of that particular word. And so mm -hmm. uh, you, you can create heuristics based on that to almost give yourself a, a confidence score, um, as mm -hmm. well as suggest alternatives uh, to different kinds of users, uh, which might just be that like, this is like this, this is like the particular output that the LLM came up with, but you, if you guys have other things that, uh, like maybe other uh, definitions of what you'd like to find the best user, et cetera, like just like give it more specific suggestions and uh, it'll then follow you uh, around those very, very specific suggestions. The last part there is is protecting against harm. So, a lot of uh, like a lot of uh, the times, if say you just have a user just, like just saying drop all tables, that can have mm -hmm. disastrous consequences yeah. for the business. Uh, right. And uh, uh, and so uh, so like for for those like very very simple things just around like data access issues, preventing um, LLM from updating, deleting, dropping anything. Uh, so we we have a lot of like heuristics around that to make sure that those things don't happen. And this generally ends up being a safe LLM that's not doing things that you're not, like, that it's, it's not supposed to do. Um, weirdly, we've even had people do SQL injections in the questions they ask. So wow. a lot of the times, like, people just ask, like, questions like, how many users do we have? Um, and then, like, end, like, single code, drop tables, uh, colon, right? And so, mm -hmm. uh, so we've just had to do a lot of, like, strips, like, string escaping uh, and just, like, other things of that nature to make sure that those things don't happen. Mm. This is pretty fascinating because uh, you have to ensure privacy, you have to ensure safety. Yeah. You have built every the whole ecosystem around the classic LLM what we see. Yeah, yeah, uh, and you you almost have to because if you're if you're asking the user to trust the output that a computer is generating and running that output on on their code, uh, you have to be sure that all of these these checks are in place there. Hmm. So. Uh, before I go to the uh, question around observability, I want to ask your experience uh, because I saw that, you know, a lot of people asked, but you couldn't reply. Uh, you met Sam Altman and uh, you were quite excited. So share some nuggets because it, I think it was a popular demand. What did you, how was it like? What did you learn? What did he say for DFOG, et cetera? Yeah, no. So, so like we, uh, like I, I got to meet Pete Sam Altman because he was in Singapore as a part of his, his world tour. And like, uh, yeah. so I, I was just one of, like 25 or, or 30 other people in the room that that, that, that were just like, like asking questions um, and just like, like, like generally just, just like giving feedback about OpenAI. 
and um, and and things uh, around that. So uh, I can't go into a lot of detail about like what was what was, okay. like, was discussed over there, but generally mm-hmm. it was uh, mostly just just things around um, where OpenAI is uh, is uh, is moving. What are like some of the the capabilities that they're going to be adding in the near future? Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, again, like Salman is just a, an incredibly busy person. I think this was his. 21st country in 30 days or some ridiculous number like that. So mm-hmm. uh, yeah, like, like I, I couldn't really like ask him any specific questions about uh, uh, like around Defog or code gen uh, in particular. Mm-hmm. Okay. I mean, just uh, everybody was curious on, under that post. I, I yeah. thought to bring this question up. All right. So uh, while building, let's say distributed systems, uh, we often rely on uh, observability. It's it's a very important thing. So what is the CPU usage? Uh, is garbage collection going unreasonably long? How do you optimize your queries, etc., etc., etc.? Does a defog do any observability, and how does the observability done in the LLMs? So for example, you said right probability distribution. So I immediately came into my mind that you know. Uh, maybe real time distribution we can monitor or if we can see a batch analytics and form some opinions out of it so would you please like to teach me how does observability happens in llms yeah uh, 100% so so honestly like we, we we just haven't had the time to build a lot of like mm. high quality observability into our system just yet um mm. we are uh doing basic things which are just like looking at what question people ask like what was the sql generated or like what was the python code generated Locking that into our uh, our, our Postgres uh, database, um, mm-hmm. seeing that if there are are any errors uh, reported, because uh, a lot of like what what we do is uh, we have what we call guided teaching. So if people uh, want to give us feedback about hey like your LM returned like this code, but this wasn't quite like the right thing for us, uh, they can kind of like do that with simple uh, thumbs up thumbs down emojis as well as like explanations for why this was a, a good or, or, or a bad uh, like output. And yeah. so, uh, so we are doing like basic collections of those kinds of things and using that to fine tune the model a lot more. Um, frankly, we need to do a lot more to uh, to do real stuff around observ- uh, around observability. Um, things that we really want to be doing is just like, is there any kind of model drift? So, like for, for the same kinds mm-hmm. of questions, is the model uh, like now generating different results um, mm-hmm. because of the fine tuning that has has uh, has happened? Is there a drift in in the kinds of questions that the model has been getting? Um, because mm-hmm. if the model is now getting the certain questions that like it is just not equipped to answer because it wasn't trained on that kind of uh, of data, you would ideally mm-hmm. like to just get alerts around that. Um, other things are just things like general GPU usage. So um, mm-hmm. one humongous problem with with GPUs is latency is is a problem, especially because mm-hmm. with LLMs you need to run them on the, these humongous GPUs. Um, and so there, uh, one way to get around it is just to batch some of these queries together. So right. uh, you can almost like just given four questions at the same time uh, so that a lot of that processing can happen in parallel, assuming that like your GPU has enough memory for that particular batch size. Um, mm. so, so there are ways to get around it. But uh, yeah, I think uh, short, uh, the main short story there is that it is, it is a huge problem we aren't doing nearly enough to address that. And we're very, very actively looking for for companies that uh, are providing some kind of uh, high quality ML observability uh, or LLM observability. Uh, yeah, yeah, but like we, we we just are not doing enough for that right now. Fascinating. So uh, talking about this, are you also hiring right now? We uh, so we have just hired our first uh, three uh, employees. And uh, at this point, like we just want to keep the team really, really, really small. Um, mm. So, uh, and uh, one of the folks we hired is this uh, amazing guy in in Bangalore uh, who uh, who started off doing front end development, but like has now learned a bunch of stuff from like everything from JavaScript to Go to Python to like actual LLM usage. Uh, we also hired one person based in uh, in Singapore who used to be a former uh, ML lead at Twitter. And uh, mm-hmm. we have one intern who's doing her master's right now. And so she's helping us a lot with uh, the, the ML uh, model fine tuning, uh, d- data generation, synthetic uh, data generation, uh, automated evaluation of uh, like how the LLM is, is, is performing and things of that nature. 
so uh, regarding hiring i i asked the same question to your on in my previous podcast so i am really interested in understanding how tech leaders who are specially building a deep tech company um how they ensure a right culture in the new hires so what's your take on that what do you look in people or how what what are the things you do in the company to make sure that you know um everybody is as, as excited as you are yeah no that's that that's a great question so um the first thing is uh we always make sure that people have worked with us um on a short time uh or, or rather like a short term like time bound assignment uh, before uh we extend them an offer and like this to, to just like make sure that this is a a fair thing for everyone involved uh mm-hmm. and and so typically this this takes a form of giving people uh a highly scoped project uh to start with where uh it could just be like create a fine tuned model for this particular thing or it, it could be mm-hmm. things like uh create like a cli interface for like like this particular task and uh, uh in that bunt we just want to see how well are like are we working with like with this person uh, how well is this person contributing like just beyond the scope of uh, of like their particular project um how many of like so like if if they face a bug like do they kind of just wait until the bug is resolved or like do they kind of dig into like source code and like fix a bug themselves and just like issue a pull request uh right so so i think that has been a great way for us to just see who are um the folks that are just like really uh enthusiastic about this thing uh and uh are uh are just like have this like go go getter mentality where they just want to get stuff done as quickly as they possibly can um so that's that's one um the other is also just uh because of how quickly elements are changing uh we don't just want to see uh, is this person really good right now but like we just want to see what the rate at which they can learn new things quickly um right. can they like wear multiple hats at the same time and so uh again working with folks for that like one month period before um both parties decide that a full time thing would be a, a good thing for both of us um is uh it's just like to see evidence of those things where uh like uh and for me one great thing to observe is is this person asking a lot of questions uh because mm-hmm. often like i've just realized that there are people who are just incredibly smart but um they want to figure everything out totally by themselves without getting help from mm-hmm. other people and um uh, often they end up just like digging themselves in, in, into this 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 space where they just, they just don't have the context and so like just seeing if someone is asking questions proactively has been a great way to see if they're going to be a good fit for us or not yeah i mean i can totally relate to that <laughs> we just we should often ask a lot of questions that's what i can recommend to the new people at yes. least yes all right so what's the next big thing uh, after llm what do you see um, and let's say if there is somebody else who wants to start in let's say llm domain or how how should it look at this industry so what are your thoughts around this yeah uh, honestly i think llms are ridiculously early right now and uh, mm. like this is something that like you like lama dot cpp is is what like it's maybe 3 months uh, until it's been released um every yeah. single week you now have uh, new models coming up that are just like beating the state of the art and something or the other mm. so i would say we're we're like literally at the very very beginning of this crazy s curve um at this mm. point in time and uh, uh so i think it's it it might be a bit too early to almost like like think about what's like next big thing because we haven't even mm. like seen um LLMs replace a lot of these like traditional uh, applications um at scale just yet i think mm. for the next 5 or 6 years uh i would like just recommend people like anyone kind of like thinking of entering the space to just like double down um mm. and like remain extremely flexible uh don't mm. burn too much money at the very beginning especially on things like compute because mm. if you raise i don't know like like 3 million dollars and like you end up burning a million and a half of that in your very first three months uh just mm-hmm. on training some very very large model uh what's going to happen six months down the line is that that cost of training would have gone from one and a half million to maybe 500k uh or even mm-hmm. $50,000 because things are just changing so so quickly right now uh so i think anyone that that kind of wants to do anything around our lens right now uh it's to just like remain extremely open minded um like understand 
and like be be very very hooked in into all the models that are are coming out, especially in in the open source world, because mm-hmm. the pace of innovation in the open source world is at least two orders of magnitude higher than it is even at at amazing companies like um, Anthropic or uh, or or OpenAI, because mm-hmm. uh, you just have so many smart people working on like really really interesting problems. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, but yeah, and I think the, the other thing I would really say is that curate interesting data sets, uh, mm-hmm. because if you have access to interesting data sets that other people do not have access to, um, you're going to be in such a privileged position uh, when it comes to being able to execute uh, that data at scale. Hmm. Fascinating insights. Uh, so what is next for defog.ai? What we can see in the next six months so that I can get hold of you again and maybe discuss from there? Yeah. Uh, so uh, in, the, in the very, very short term, we just want to bring some of these these features we have in closed beta right now to all users. Uh, so uh, the, the biggest one is this thing we have called agents. And so there, uh, what these, these agents are doing is like, these are these human in the loop problem solving systems. So if you just want to ask something like, based on, on data for the last one, uh, what are your, your recommendations for increasing the revenue for my company? So we, we almost have agents that spin up 10 different hypotheses all at the same time. Um, they just ask you, okay, like these are some ideas I have for investigating your question. Um, do you want to like, which, which one of these do you think is relevant? Do you want to edit one of these? Do you just want to like mark some of them as, as irrelevant? And then uh, they kind of like go deeper like and, and execute all of these things. And so, uh, and towards the end, uh, and LLM kind of synthesizes the results of, of all of these like approaches that uh, each kind of uh, each each like train of thought has been like synthesized into a particular like cohesive result, um, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, and like this is all done with a human in the loop at all times. So next month we're hoping to like get this out of uh, of our closed beta and like get it in, in the hands of of all users, um, and uh, 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 beyond that, what we're really looking for is doing this thing in, in a much more domain specific way. Uh, because uh, a lot of our models right now, like you just have to pay us a lot of money for us to fight you a model for you. And we just want to mm-hmm. make sure that we can bring the cost of that down uh, very, very significantly, uh, both with software optimizations and figuring out like better models, like, like maybe just around things like if you allow us to use uh, this, this data for like fine tuning general models instead of like just, just your own model, uh, you might get like a, a discounted price or, or things like that. So uh, we have to do a lot more innovation on process and pricing uh, to make mm-hmm. sure that a lot of the benefits of DeepFog is available to a lot more people. Um, they're also just going to be uh, making our free plan uh, a bit more generous as well as like introducing a slightly cheaper plan. Because uh, right now, like until last week to get API access, you had to pay us $600 a month. And mm-hmm. um, we realized that a lot of people just um, like, if, if, they, if they were just looking to experiment, that, that was just an unrealistic amount. Right. And so uh, they've just launched a free API plan where uh, you can connect Defog with uh, like uh, up to four tables with like up to 225 total columns and just like start asking questions uh, on that small database. Um, and uh, so we're just going to be doing a lot more innovations in getting this into the hands of more people uh, and just making it, it a lot more efficient, uh, br- bringing down latency uh and, and things of that nature really uh, why not i mean just a ridiculous question here why not build a defog for let's say images so show me the images of you know something like that i'm not really sure how will that work but maybe an image search on defog that will be quite cool <laughs> yeah I, I think the the strange thing of being in this space right now is that this is so many plausible ideas to go into yeah. that if you try and do all of those, you are just left very, very thin. Uh, and so like, we, we just want to really focus on this structured data thing at this point in time. Mm. Uh, maybe add in that, that unstructured data demo that, that you saw where like, we're just querying my notion, yeah. et cetera. Um, but we just want to be able to do a few things incredibly well right now, instead of trying to do like a lot of very interesting ideas. And um, again, as a builder, this is a really frustrating process because like, I just look at all these interesting applications that I, I I'm just thinking, oh, it would be so cool if you could end up like building something around that. But we just have to be incredibly focused right now to make sure that we continue to deliver value to our customers and um, continue to build something that's of lasting value instead of just an interesting demo. And so for that, like I think that this whole structured data thing plus agents and and everything that 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 involves 
um, SQL uh, data, numerical data, and things of that nature. Uh, we're just going to be, be be doubling down on that for the near future. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Rishabh. It was fascinating talking to you. I learned a lot about LLM ecosystem. How do you, um, the different stages of LLM, fine tuning, serving the models and stuff like that. Before uh, we wrap up, would you like to give the listeners or yourself what you could have said to yourself five years ago, right? So a younger person what or somebody starting in, in the field of entrepreneurship, what would you recommend them? Uh, I think the first thing I would recommend is just like give yourself a lot of shots at goal um, because a lot of people, they they try to get something to work and uh, it doesn't work and then they they feel very, very discouraged uh, and they just like give up and like don't, don't, don't do that again. Um, I think that can be a really scary and risky place to be in. Um, and I had five startups that completely failed um, uh, before uh, Loki.ai, which was my my previous company, uh, did well, and like again, Loki was was like a pretty like pretty solid company doing like mid six figure revenues um, for a while, um, and uh, uh, and a lot of that for me was just like knowing when to step away from something that wasn't working, and uh, like giving myself like ensuring that I always had the emotional reserves ready to keep having like more shots at goal. Um, the other mm-hmm. thing I would say is like start early because uh, if you wait until it's it's too late um, for you uh, to, uh, to 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 like, like try something out. Uh, mm-hmm. Like if you're if you're at a point where you have a lot of bills to pay and uh, you uh, just cannot take the risk of mm-hmm. uh, like maybe not having any income come in for the next three years, um, that can be a lot more difficult to sustain. And so when you're much younger, you just like don't have those things because your bud is so ridiculously low. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, the earlier you start, like the more shots you have a target. Uh, and even if you fail, like the more you learn from those failures. And like, as long as you're not failing in the same ways all the time, uh, yeah. you will end up like learning. And uh, yeah, like, like essentially it's just gradient descent applied to human beings uh, that just ends up working out very well. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Rishub. And I'm sure that, you know, uh, a lot of people will take a lot of things from this regarding LLMs and defog.ai and the general stuff, what we talked about. Thank you for your time. Appreciate this, this very, very much, Vipul. And looking forward to doing this again uh, six months from now, maybe. Absolutely. Fascinating discussion, isn't it? I really loved our discussion with Rishab. I learned a lot. I understood a lot about LLM ecosystem. How do we do the observability? How do we do deployment? What is quantization and things like that? One key takeaway from my side from this video was how as a startup, one has to be really agile and think long term because the training cost can reduce over time and we cannot spend all the money right now because you know, we might feel stupid later on. The second thing, which I really loved about how do you have to be agile and think Like the world of LLM is like an S curve. So we are just getting started right now. Every other week we have got, we are getting, you know, amazing breakthroughs. So as he said, right, Lama.cpp is just three months old. So in that case, how do you keep yourself updated and agile as a data scientist and as well as a startup founder, that's, that becomes really challenging. So I enjoyed this discussion a lot. And if you did the same, then make sure that you subscribe this channel, share this video with your friends and comment down your favorite takeaway. That's all for this one, guys. See you in the next one.